God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, to begin with here in this moment, uh, as I was preparing this sermon this week, it's a thought that kind of kept rolling through my mind, and it gives me an opportunity, of course, that I never want to give up, is to talk about the Lord of the Rings, and specifically the, the final, the return of the king. And so at this point, towards the end of that scene, and I mean, you know, everything has happened, um, they've, the, the hobbits are back on their way home, and, and he starts to consider, right, Frodo and his friends, it's been over a year since they left the Shire and went on this adventure, and then they've been through all kinds of moments and events, and things have happened to them, been done to them, and they've been involved in so many things and met so many people, things and people that they could never have imagined while living in the comforts of the Shire. But after all this, after all they've been through, including the destruction of the ring and the defeat of the evil Lord, now they're returning back home, back to the Shire, back to where things, in some ways, don't seem like they've changed at all. And yet here's the question that Frodo asks. He says, how can I I pick up the pieces of an old life? How do you pick up the pieces of a previous life? Many of us have maybe been even asking that same question with regards to the virus and COVID-19 and so much has changed. And when some of the stay-at-home orders are lifted and we can start kind of going back to what we would consider to be normal life, what will normal life be? What will it even look like and how will we interact and what will happen in our, in our world? And so how do we pick up the pieces of an old life? And I know that you have had experiences that have had that same kind of impact on you that have resulted in that same experience of how do I pick up the pieces? How do I go on with life after all that has happened? Well, as, as you've just heard in these three readings, three different scenarios where people had uh, significant experiences, the loss of loved ones. And many times the question is, how do you pick up those pieces? How do you go on with life? And specifically, when we consider the fact that as far as we understand and what's recorded for us in the Gospels, these are the only three that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. What about the others? Why would Jesus raise these three people from the dead? I'm convinced, and I think as we go through this process together, looking into the Scriptures, you might agree with me that Jesus raised these people from the dead to generate faith, hope, and love in those that Jesus loves. And so we'll see that in each of these scenarios as we go through them together. I, I admit to you that I don't have any more funny jokes. And I don't really have any funny stories to share with you as we look at these three stories in the Gospels. But I think they speak for themselves. And I am certain that God has so much in store for you. It will be better than a joke or a story. Above all, God's love and grace causes us to live. And not only live, but to thrive. So let's take a look at these three stories and the people who will be uh, raised by the risen one. Our first scenario, if you're taking notes, following along with the outline, uh, it's a desperate mom. That's the character we're going to look at in this story, is the desperate mom. As you heard, it was her only son. From Luke chapter 7, as Jesus approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Consider her situation in this moment as they are leaving town, carrying her, as we would understand the Scripture to tell us, an adult son, someone who would have been caring for her, providing for her. And so now, not only has she lost her husband because she's a widow, she has also lost her son, her beloved son, who is also now her provider. This is grief upon grief, upon grief, which leaves our mom hopeless. Hopeless for the future. Hopeless for what to do next. She has, in this culture, in this context, she has no means to provide for herself. And in her, very, in her moment, she may have been thinking to herself, and I may as well die now too. There is no reason left to live and maybe no means of provision to live. Grief upon grief upon grief, destitute, isolated, and alone. And now, as they are leaving town in this procession, and the pallbearers are carrying 
what do you think? What can you imagine? The, I mean, first, just having Jesus walk up and touch and say, wake up. Pallbearers must have been astonished, surprised. What just happened? And now this individual we were carrying because he was passed away is now alive again. And Jesus gives him to his mother. Can you imagine the response of the crowd? As all this is taking place, they're on their way to bury a body, and now they're rejoicing. Things in one moment have reversed and changed for the crowd. And ultimately, can you imagine the response of the mother? Going from being hopeless, destitute, and alone, to now rejoicing because of having received her son back. And I love the statement that the crowd makes. They were all filled with awe, and they praised God. They claimed that he must be a great prophet. And then they said this, God has come to help his people. In a moment of hopelessness, it is all transformed because now the risen one has raised them and given them hope. I mean, obviously, right? It was the son who Jesus Christ raised from the dead. But I think what we see here is the mom was raised by the risen one, raised to new hope, to new life, life renewed for her and for all those around. And so this desperate mom now became a hope-filled mom. It brings us to our second group of people, the devastated parents. We know that the father's name was Jairus, and he had traveled to find Jesus, to plead with him to come and to heal his only daughter, a daughter of 12 years old. In this broken world, we expect people to pass away. In fact, sometimes sometimes when somebody does pass away, a question that we ask is, well, was it expected? Did this come as a surprise? Was there an illness that this person had been struggling with? Or maybe because they're aged, we start to say, well, maybe we understand. We understand that death is part of life, and and so we kind of expect this to happen sometimes. But, But no one, no one should have to bury a child. No one. See, death is wrong. Death is just wrong at any age for anyone. It's the, it's the result of our brokenness because of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. And so we all face the inevitable of death. But experiencing the death of a child goes beyond wrong. It goes so far beyond what we could imagine as to how much our hearts could break. The wretched misery is this, that when a child dies, it screams to us, that no one is exempt from the effects of our brokenness. And so now we have these parents crushed, and I I would believe despairing, despairing over the loss of their daughter, and not only crushed and despairing and wondering, can life possibly go on? Maybe even feeling betrayed. Because I think as parents, both now and then, We kind of believe that we'll have the opportunity to raise and nurture our children and watch them grow up and experience life. And we've come to expect that and trust that it will happen. And and then when it doesn't, we're betrayed. We feel betrayed anyway. And maybe these parents felt some shame. Maybe they were blaming themselves, thinking we could have done something, we should have done something. It's our fault that our little girl is dying. I've known parents who have wrestled with that very thing, feeling like they should have been able to do something, protected their child, cared for their child, done something. And so maybe these parents are blaming themselves for the death of their 12-year-old daughter as well. And sometimes we, you have, I know you have lost your children due to death. I also know that some of you listening to this will be able to understand the fact that you lost your children because of a broken relationship, even though your child may still be alive. And that separation is no less painful. To have lost the relationship with a child at any age is devastating. And so in our first situation, we had a 
a desperate mom asking the question, how can I go on? I don't see how I can go on. And now we have parents, parents of a 12-year-old girl saying, I don't think I want to go on. How can there be anything good left in this life? And this is what Jesus says to those parents and what I believe he's saying to each one of us today is don't be afraid, just believe. Whatever your pain and heartache might be, Jesus is saying to you, don't be afraid, just believe. Consider this, God knows your pain and suffering. For there was great grief that had been experienced in heaven on the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross. But remember, he died for you. He died for all people, for our salvation, so that you and those you love can have eternity in his presence. So for the mom, Jesus gave hope. And for these parents, he gives faith. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Which brings us to our third, the depressed sisters. They, the mom lost her only son, and these parents lost their only daughter, and Mary and Martha lost their only brother. And I imagine they were sad beyond measure. They were a family of three, as far as the Scriptures tell us, two sisters and a brother, grown children, and they loved one another, cared for one another, and now the loss is great and the agony intense, and they have broken hearts. Extreme disappointment. And I think the disappointment is com compounded by the fact that they had sent word to Jesus and said, Jesus, the one you love, your dear friend, is ill and dying. I'm thinking they were certain that he would come and that he would get there just in time because he loved them. They believed he loved them, and so he would come. But when he arrives, after delaying for two days and then traveling there, we're told that Lazarus has already passed away and been in the tomb for several days. And Martha, both Martha and Mary, share this sentiment with Jesus. They say, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. If you had been here, things would have turned out different. And so they're left with questions like, didn't you get the message? Didn't you hear us? Didn't you hear us cry out to you? Don't you love us? Jesus, don't you care? Why didn't you act when you could have? Maybe you've asked that same question. Maybe you've wondered if Jesus was hearing you cry out and pray. You wondered if he loved you or cared, if he would answer your prayers. Be assured of this truth. God does what is best for you because he loves you. Even when it doesn't make sense to us, he does what is best for us because he loves us. I guarantee you it probably did not make sense to the disciples. First, they say things like, well, shouldn't we let him sleep? If he sleeps, he'll get better. And Jesus says, no, he's passed away. He has died already. And then Thomas Thomas says, well, if he's going back to Jerusalem and, and the area there where they're trying to kill him, we might as well go with. Well, we might as well go with him and we'll die too. And so I think Thomas was a glass half empty kind of guy, as Ryan would have pointed out. But it didn't make sense to them. Why go now, Jesus, if he's already dead? We've missed our opportunity. Maybe the crowd didn't make sense to them either. You know, they had heard that Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they were loved by Jesus, and so they were drawing conclusions. In fact, when he shows up, when Jesus arrives and he, he shows compassion, he weeps, the crowd says, maybe he did love Lazarus. We were wondering, we were doubting. Maybe, maybe it wasn't like we thought, but here he is, he's weeping at the tomb. Maybe he really did love them. The sisters may have been wondering and confused, and it didn't make sense to them either. Martha understood the theological answer, that awesome truth that says that Jesus Christ is the res resurrection and the life, and all who believe in him will live with him for eternity. But Martha's saying, what about now? 
I know you're the resurrection and that Lazarus will be raised again. But what about now? And I have to chuckle a little bit. I wonder about Lazarus if he wasn't a little bit confused and didn't make sense to him. Wait a minute, Jesus, I've been in heaven for four days. Why are you calling me back? But ultimately, everything Jesus does is because of love. Love for you, for me, for everyone. We struggle, though. We despair, just like the mother. We feel abandoned. We feel doubt, like the parents, like the sisters. We are disappointed with God because he isn't doing it the way we would do it. If God loves me, he would do what I would have done, right? Or some nature of that. If God really loved me, he would do what I would do. He would have come right away. He would arrive in the nick of time. He would turn things around. Just like this situation, he would have cured Lazarus and prevented the death to begin with. Why doesn't God do what we would do? Well, the answer is in the question. Because it's what we would do. It's what we would do. We're broken. We're flawed. Our perspectives are skewed. We are still impacted by the brokenness of sin. And we don't love like God loves. In fact, we cannot love like God loves. And so to conclude, I'd like to just remind us of the conversation that took place between Peter and Jesus to emphasize this final point. As Jesus has been telling the disciples that he will suffer and he will die and he will rise again, this is when Peter calls him aside, puts his arm around his shoulders and said, let me give you a little advice here, Jesus. Talking about this suffering and dying is not really instilling a whole lot of confidence and hope in the fellas. And, uh, and let me just kind of, if it's all right with you, Jesus, I'll give you some advice because what you're suggesting, it's not what I would do. I think that's what Peter's message is in a nutshell. Jesus, what you're talking about is not what I would do. And Jesus says, exactly, exactly. But because I love you, this is what I am going to do for you. I will suffer, and I will die, and I will rise again. So whatever it is that we would do, Jesus says, I'm going to do everything for you out of love. You are raised. That is the truth. You are raised to hope, faith, and love because you are raised by the risen one. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Almighty God and our Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for the gifts you give to us out of your love and grace and that what you give to us, no matter what circumstance or situation we're facing, no matter how devastated we are, desperate we are, or saddened we are, you give us faith, hope, and love. Help us to receive them from you this morning and every day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.